Our next speaker is Janine Lanza. She's an associate professor at Wayne State University in Detroit, Michigan. And um, her title of her talk today is Working Women's Lives in Early Modern France. I too have no slides, so I can get going right away. So uh, when Sarah asked me to be on this panel, I was thrilled. Um, and I was thinking, since I also was not a Georgetown graduate student, I was thinking about the ways that Jim's work uh, has influenced me. And of course, I work on women and the guilds and economic activity. And so his article on the economic role of women in 17th century France has been sort of a touchstone for much of what I've done. And as I was working on this paper, I was also clearing out my office for the end of the semester. And I found no fewer than four copies of that article <laughs> fully annotated. All of them, all of those copies with different uh, ideas and thoughts that, that they uh, brought to me. So I think that this, for me, is an indication of the depth of, of the meaning of that work. So as um, that uh, article first showed us, despite barriers, uh, to economic activity, women have routinely violated every law, edict, regulation, norm that spoke of their exclusion and in fact pushed into virtually every corner of the economy. Women worked alongside men in myriad ways from agricultural labor to unskilled employment to female guilds and virtually all occupations in between. Um, so while the important economic contributions made by women in early modern France have been explored at, in depth, uh, I, in my work, I look at the ways women, whether as wives, daughters, or hired hands, uh, played key roles in the success of guild enterprises headed by men, uh, or more broadly, how women in guild families performed an array of tasks similar to those performed by men. Uh, here today, I'm going to talk very briefly about how women contributed to the running of family businesses in 18th century uh, Paris and speculate as to how and why women were able to occupy key roles in family businesses, even while their contributions were not always acknowledged by their contemporaries. Uh, I argue that women were indispensable to the success of family business, providing labor, support, acumen, and uh, wealth not available to guild masters from other avenues. So there are many reasons why women were so active in artisanal businesses, especially those run by their families. Most wives and virtually all daughters of master artisans were raised in artisanal households, learning the family trade as they grew up. Children started with simple tasks and moved on to take greater responsibility as they became more capable. When children of master artisans married, they almost always chose a spouse whose family practiced the same or related trade. Such marriage practices meant that spouses shared experiences and cultures of guild work. A master's wife could step into the shop and understand the hierarchy of workers, the corporate principles that shaped relations and activities in the shop, and the concrete tasks that needed to be done to keep the business running. From working with clients to keeping accounts to engaging in production, wives had the experience and expertise to do what needed to be done. Archival accounts show that wives had a sense of professional identity and competence that empowered them to work confidently in their family businesses. Um, now, in addition to providing skilled and reliable labor and expertise uh, about the trade and running a business, wives brought other more concrete assets to a marriage, namely the goods and other material resources that both spouses contributed to their newly formed households. A shift in the uses of marriage contracts used to structure unions and artisanal families took place across the 17th century, a change that provided new couples with more material resources for their households than in earlier times. In brief, by the middle of the 17th century, and I'm not quite sure when this happened, so um, don't pin me down on that, uh, marriage contracts of artisanal families provided children with substantial assets at the beginning of their married lives, by means of the marriage contracts, which more and more artisanal families used when their children married. Even families with relatively modest wealth, contributions as low as 100 livres, used contracts to determine what spouses would bring to a marital fund. These marriage settlements gave children and their fledgling, fledgling households a huge boost in their business prospects. Rather than waiting for the death of a parent to claim a share of family wealth, which tended to be the practice earlier in the 17th century and, and prior, 
children could put their share of assets toward their businesses and success at the outset of their married lives. Uh, the origin of this change in how older generations handed property down to younger generations lay in part in laws passed in the 16th and 17th centuries that gave parents greater control over the marriages of children. In the centuries between the Reformation and the French Revolution, a low-key but deep rivalry simmered between the French monarchy and the Catholic Church. One of the key areas of disagreement between these two institutions concerned jurisdiction over marriage. Uh, briefly, uh, marriage was, uh, um, what constituted a valid marriage was decided by canon law and clergy and church courts. One of the touchstones of a valid marriage was the consent of partners. If husband and wife declared their consent to the union, especially if that was followed by consummation, the marriage was uh, valid. This doctrine could undermine parents' plans to arrange marriages for their children, but despite attempts to try to get around these restrictions, uh, canon law definitions of marriage stayed in place. Marriage was a religious act governed by canon law and solemnized by the clergy. Secular laws could uh, only go so far in regulating marriages. Now, this issue of marriage is a major concern for elite members of society. It doesn't really touch artisanal families that I've found. Um, most marriages are sort of created by families in consultation with children. Now, uh, but there was a way in which those changing laws did affect artisanal families, uh, which is that while artisanal couples did not face turmoil over the choice of marriage partners, the laws designed to punish disobedient children did affect their marriage arrangements. Uh, as parents, parents used wealth more frequently as a mechanism to reward their children when they made an advantageous marriage, more artisanal couples started their partnerships with substantial assets which they could leverage into business success. Um, so rather than accessing family wealth upon the death uh, of parents, children received money and goods at a point in their lives when it was very useful to them. Uh, further, since the Coutume de Paris called for partable inheritance and included mechanisms that were meant to ensure equal portions for all heirs, male and uh, female, women and men, had an equal share to the uh, family assets, equal claim to their share of family assets. Um, in Paris, artisanal families had the means to provide children with capital to help establish their new households. Uh, since women brought wealth with them, generally speaking the same amounts as their husbands and sometimes more I have found, I suggest that they had a sense of ownership in their enterprises which validated and encouraged them to work. Uh, and that also provided them with a kind of authority as significant investors in familial businesses that justified their being active players in uh, family uh, economic decisions. Women central to the economy by virtue of their skill and labor also became central to the economic success of many artisanal enterprises by dint of the financial contributions they made. Now, I have many marriage contracts from the 17th and 18th century that provide information about the wealth future spouses provided to their new households. I just want to give two examples here, just to give a sense of what kind of assets women could bring with them, as well as the relative worth of their contributions. So first, uh, when Catherine Gravel, the daughter of a Parisian surgeon, married master ribbon maker Louis Labbé, she contributed a substantial amount of property to the new household. She had a dowry of 300 livres, as well as 900 livres in cash for the household, and another 920 livres worth of household and personal goods. Uh, her husband had received his mastership just prior to the couple's marriage, and this influx of liquid capital was undoubtedly a welcome addition to the new business. Uh, L'Abbé and Gravel uh, would inherit his parents' ribbon-making business just a few years after this contract was signed, and having all that ready cash would help them make their enterprise a success. And um, I've seen their probate inventory later on. When he dies, they're fantastically wealthy, I think partly based on this nest egg. Uh, her substantial investment in the new household and the fact that Parisian couples held much of their property jointly meant that she would have a strong claim to a voice in the family enterprise. Another marriage contract records the bride's contribution of virtually an entire business to her new husband. Uh, Etiennette Bonardo married Jean-Pierre uh, Jean Bon Bonselin, the journeyman who worked in her parents' locksmith business. Uh, the, the groom, Bonselin, provided 1,500 livres in cash, as well as an additional 300 livres worth of household and personal goods. 
The bride's dowry, Bonaldo's dowry, consisted of 6,000 livres in assets from her parents' business, as well as 800 livres in household and personal goods. The contract further stipulated that the young couple would work in the family shop until the following October, after which time they would take complete possession of the business. Uh, at that moment, the bride's parents pledged to add another 3,000 livres of tools and materials to the dowry. Although the bride Bonselin, uh, I'm sorry, although the groom Bonselin as the master locksmith would be the legal head of this business, I think it is no exaggeration to assert that in terms of capital investment, his wife, Bonaldo, was essentially the proprietor of this business. Um, so in addition to the ways that women brought labor, skill, <coughs> acumen, talent to their family enterprises, here I think we see another mechanism for women to be meaningful and key economic actors. Uh, and the ways uh, they achieved that was not by dint of the work of their hands, but by dint of the wealth, uh, assets, and connections that they brought to their new families. Thank you.